Well, here we are. Friday, September 2nd, 2022. I'm Larissa. Mm. Now, Pellegrino. So, <sighs> getting back to reading here. Haroon and the Sea of Stories by Mr. Salman Rushdie. I have to say, Mr. Rushdie, the last couple, this last chapter, chapter seven, today we're going to read chapter eight. I say chapter seven, storytelling, got a little lazy. We'll see. I don't know, I would have added a whole other chapter. Just my own thoughts. Anyway, chapter eight, Shadow Warriors. The effort of producing sounds twisted the shadow warrior's already striking face, green skin, scarlet lips, white striped cheeks, etc., into dreadful contorted shapes. Go, 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 he gurgled. Cuff, cuff, ka, he coughed. A, eh, what's that? What's the fellow saying? demanded Prince Bolo loudly. Can't make out a single word. What a poser, I swear. Blabbermouth hissed at her own. Our Bolo talking so big and rude because he thinks it stops us from noticing that he's scared out of his pants. Haroon wondered why Blabbermouth remained in Prince Bolo's service when she had such a low opinion of the gentleman, but he kept his mouth shut, partly because he didn't want her to say something cutting and scornful to him, partly because he had started to like her a good deal, which made any opinion of hers okay with him, but mostly because there was a giant shadow with a huge sword looming over them and a warrior grunting and spitting at them a few feet away. And in short, this was no time for chit-chat. If, as it is said, people in the land of Chup hardly talk at all these days because of the cult master's decrees, then it's not surprising that this warrior has temporarily lost control of his voice, Rashid Khalifa was explained to Prince Bolo, who was unimpressed. It's too bad, he said, really. Why people can't speak properly, it beats me. The shadow warrior, ignoring the prince, made further rapid hand gestures at Rashid and managed to croak out a few words. Murder, it said. Spock will be New Year. So it's murder he plans, cried Bolo, putting his hand upon the hilt of his sword. Well, he won't have it all his own way, I promise him that. Bolo, said General Khatib. Dash it all, will you be quiet? Spots and fogs, this warrior is trying to tell us something. The shadow warrior's hand movements became agitated and a little desperate. He twiddled his fingers into different positions, held his hands at different angles, pointed at different parts of his body, and repeated hoarsely, Murder, murder, Spock, will be New Year. Rashid Khalifa smacked his forehead. I've got it, he exclaimed. What a fool I am. He's been talking to us fluently all the time. Don't be ridiculous, Prince Bolo put in. You call those grunts fluency? It's the hand movements, Rashid answered, showing considerable restraint at Bolo's burblings. He's been using the language of gesture. As for what he said, it wasn't murder, but mudra. That's his name. He's been trying to introduce himself. Mudra, speak Abahanaya. That's what he's been saying, Abhinaya. It's the name of the most ancient gesture language of all, which, I, which it just so happens I know. Mudra and his shadow instantly began nodding furiously. Now the shadow sheathed his sword too and began to use gesture language as rapidly as Mudra himself, so that Ra uh, Rashid was obliged to plead, hang on, one at a time please, and slowly, I haven't done this for a long time and you're going too fast for me. After a few moments of listening to the hands of Mudra and his shadow, Rashid turned to General Khatib and Prince Bolo with a smile. Nothing to worry about, he said. Mudra is a friend also. This is a lucky meeting, for we have here none other than the champion warrior of Chup, considered by most Chupwallas to be second in authority only to cult master Katumshud himself. 
If he's Katum, Katum Shud's number two man, Prince Bolo exclaimed, then we really are in luck. Let's seize him and put him in chains and tell the cult master we'll only release him if we get Batcheat back safe and sound. And how do you propose to capture him? General Khatib mildly asked. I do not think he wishes to be captured, you know. Harumph. Please listen, Rashid urged. Mudra is no longer an ally of the cult masters. He has become disgusted with the growing cruelty and fanaticism of the cult of the tongueless ice idol Bezabon, and has broken off relations with Katum Shud. He came here to this twilight wilderness to think out what he should do next. If you wish, I can interpret his Abanaya for you. General Khatib nodded and Mudra began to speak. Harun noticed that the language of gesture involved more than just the hands. The position of the feet was important, too, and eye movements as well. In addition, Mudra possessed a phenomenal degree of control over each and every muscle in his green-painted face. He could make bits of his face twitch and ripple in, in the most remarkable way, and this, too, was part of his speaking, his abanaya. Don't think all Chukwalas follow Katum Shu or worship his Bezaban, Mudra said in his silent dancing way, and Rashid translated his words into ordinary speech. Mostly, they are simply terrified of the cult master's great powers of sorcery. But if he were defeated, most people in Chup would turn to me, and though my shadow and I are warriors, we are both in favor of peace. Now, it was the shadow's turn to speak. You must understand that in the land of Chup, shadows are considered the equals of the people to whom they are joined, it began, with Rashid translating again. Chupwalas live in the dark, you know, and in the dark, a shadow doesn't have to be one single shape all the time. Some shadows, such as my good self, learn how to change ourselves simply by wishing to do so. Imagine the advantages. If a shadow doesn't care for the clothes, sense, sense or hairstyle of the person to whom it's attached, it can simply choose a style for itself. A Chupwala shadow can be graceful as a dancer, even if its owner is clumsy as an oaf. You comprehend? What's more, in the land of Chup, a shadow very often has a stronger personality than the person or self or substance to whom or to which it is joined. So often the shadow leads, and it is the person or self or substance that follows. And of course, there can be quarrels between the shadow and the substance or self or person. They can pull in opposite directions. How often have I witnessed that? But just as often, there is a true partnership, a mutual respect. So, peace with the Chupwalas means peace with their shadows, too. And among the shadows, also, cult master Katum Shud has made terrible trouble. Mudra, the shadow warrior, resumed the, na the narrative. Quicker and quicker moved his hands, and his facial muscles rippled and twitched in a most excited way, and his legs danced nimbly and fast. Rashid had to work very hard to keep up with him. Katum Shud's black magic has had fearsome results, Mudra revealed. He has plunged so deeply into the dark art of sorcery that he has become shadowy himself, changeable, dark, more like a shadow than a person. And as he has become more shadowy, so his shadow has become more like a person. And, and the point has come at which it's no longer possible to tell which is Katam Shud's shadow and which is his substantial self, because he has done what no other Chukwala has ever dreamt of. That is, he has separated himself from his shadow. He goes about in the darkness, entirely shadowless, and his shadow goes wherever it wishes. The cult master, Katam Shud, can be in two places at once. At this point, Blabbermouth, who had been gazing at the shadow warrior with something very like adoration or devotion, burst out, But that's the worst news in the world! It was going to be almost impossible to defeat him once, and now you tell us we've, we have to beat him twice? Precisely so, said the grim gestures of Mudra's shadow. Furthermore, this new doubled Katam Shud, this man shadow and shadow man, has had a very harmful effect on the friendships between Chupwalas and their shadows. Now many shadows are resentful of being joined to Chupwalas at the feet, and there are many quarrels. It is a sad time, Mudra's gestures concluded, when a Chupwala cannot even trust his own shadow. A silence fell as General Khatib and Prince Bolo mulled, mulled over everything that Mudra and his shadow had said. Then Prince Bolo burst out. Why should we believe this creature? Hasn't he admitted he's a traitor to his own leader? Must we do business with traitors now? How do we know this isn't more of his treason? Some deep laid plan, some sort of trap. Now General Khatib, as Haroon had observed, was as, 
was as a rule the mildest of men, who liked nothing so much as a good argument. But on this occasion, he went pink in the face and seemed to swell up slightly. Hang it all, your highness, he, he finally said. I'm in command here. Hold your tongue or you'll be on your way back to Gup City, and someone else will have to rescue your bat sheet on, on your behalf. And you wouldn't like that, I guess. Spots and fogs, you wouldn't. Blabbermouth looked delighted at this reprimand. Bolo looked murderous, but held his tongue. Which was just as well because Mudra's shadow had responded to Bolo's outburst by going into a positive frenzy of, ch of changes, growing enormous, scratch scratching itself all over, turning into the silhouette of a flame-breathing dragon, and then into other creatures, a, a griffin, a basilisk, a manticore, a troll. And while the shadow behaved in this agitated fashion, Mudra himself retreated a few steps, leant on a tree stump, and pretended to have grown very bored indeed, examining his fingernails, yawning, twiddling his thumbs, this warrior and his shadow are a fine team, Haroon thought. They put on opposite acts so nobody knows what they really feel, which may, of course, be a third thing completely. General Khatib approached Mudra with great, even, exa even exaggerated respect. Blow it all, Mudra, will you help us? It isn't going to be easy in this darkness of chuck. We could do with a fellow like you, mighty warrior and all that. What do you say? Prince Bolo sulked at the edge of the clearing while Mudra paced and thought, then he began to gesture once again. Rashid translated his words. Yes, I will help, the shadow warrior said, for the cult master must surely be defeated, but there is a decision you must make. I bet I know what it is, Blabbermouth hissed at Haroon. It's the same one that should have been made before we, we even set out. What do we save first, Batsheet or the ocean? By the way, she added, blushing slightly, isn't he something? Isn't he wicked, awesome, sharp? Mudra, I mean. I know who you mean, said Haroon, with a pang of what might have been jealousy. He's okay, I suppose. Okay, hissed Blabbermouth. Only okay? How can you even say? But here she broke off because Mudra's words were being translated by Rashid. As I told you, there are now two Katam Shuds. One of them, at this very moment, has Princess Batshi captive in the Citadel of Chup and is planning to set up her, is, is planning to sew up her lips on the Feast of Bezabon. The other, as you know, is in the old zone, where he is plotting the ruination of the ocean of the stream of streams of story. An immense stubbornness came over Prince Bolo of Gup. Say what you will, General, he cried, but a person must come before an ocean, no matter how great the peril to both. It must be Batsheet first. Batsheet, my love, my only girl. Her cherry lips must be saved from the cult master's needle, and without further delay, what are you people? Have you not blood in your veins? General, and you too, Sir Mudra, are you men or, or shadows? There is no need to insult shadows any further, Mudra's shadow gesture with quiet, Mudra's shadow gestured with quiet dignity. Bolo ignored it. Very well, General Khatib agreed. Rot it all very well, but we must send someone to investigate the old zone situation. But whom? Now let me see. Harumph. It was at this instant that Haroon cleared his throat. <clears throat> I'll go, he volunteered. All eyes turned to stare at him as he stood there in his red nightshirt with the purple patches, feeling fairly ridiculous. Hmm, what's that you say? Prince Bolo irritably demanded. Once you thought my father was spying for Katum Shoot against you, Haroon said. Now, if you and the general wish, I'll spy for you upon Katum Shoot or his shadow, whichever of them is down there in the old zone poisoning the ocean. And why, strap and blast me, do you volunteer for this dangerous job? General Khatib wanted to know. Good question, Haroon thought. I must be a very great fool, but what he said aloud was this. Well, sir, it's like this. All my life I've heard about the wonderful sea of stories and water genies and everything. But I started believing only when I saw If in my bathroom the other night. And now that I've actually come to Kahani and seen with my own eyes how beautiful the ocean is, with its story streams and colors whose names I don't even know, and its floating gardeners and plenty maw fishes and all, well, it turns out I may be too late because the whole ocean's going to be dead any minute if we don't do something. And it turns out that I don't like the idea of that, sir. Not one bit. I don't like the idea that all the good stories in the world will go wrong forever and ever or just die. As I say, I only just started believing in the ocean, but maybe it isn't too late for me to do my bit. There, he thought. 
You've really done it now, made yourself look, look a complete idiot. But Blabbermouth was looking at him in much the same way she'd been staring at Mudra for some time, and that was pleasant. It couldn't be denied. And then he caught sight of his father's expression, and oh no, he thought, I know exactly what he's going to say. There's more to you, young Haroon Khalifa, than meets the blinking eye, said Rashid. Forget it, mumbled Haroon furiously. Forget I even spoke. Prince Bolo strode over and thumped Haroon on the back, leaving him winded. Out of the question, Bolo was shouting, forget you spoke. Young man, it will never be forgotten. General, I ask you, is this not the perfect fellow for the job? For he is, like me, a slave to love. Here, Haroon avoided looking at Blabbermouth and blushed. Yes, indeed, Prince Bolo continued, striding about and waving his arms in a dashing and somewhat foolish way. Just as my great passion, my amour, leads me to Batcheat, always towards Batcheat, so this boy's destiny is to rescue what he loves, that is, the ocean of stories. Very well, General Khatib gave in. Young Master Haroon, you will be our spy. Dread it all, you deserve it. Take your pick of companions and be gone. His voice sounded gruff as if he were hiding his worries beneath a facade of sternness. That's finished it, Haroon thought. Too late to back out now. Keep a sharp lookout. Skulk in the shadows. See without being seen, cried Bolo dramatically, and away. You'll be a shadow warrior, too. To reach the old zone of Kahani, it was necessary to travel through, to travel south through the twilight strip, hugging the shoreline of the land of Chuck until that dark and silent continent was left behind and the southern polar ocean of Kahani stretched in every direction. Haroon and If, the water genie, set off on, on this route within an hour of Haroon's volunteering. Their chosen companion, companions were the Plenimaw fishes, Goopy and Baga, who bubbled along in their, in their wake, and the gnarled and floating gar gardener, Molly, with his lilac lips and hat of roots. Molly walked on the water at their side. Haroon had wanted to take Blabbermouth, but a shyness overcame him, and besides, she seemed to want to stay with Mudra, the shadow warrior. And Rashid had been needed, had been needed to translate Mudra's gesture language to the general and the prince. After several hours of high-speed travel through the twilight strip, they found themselves in the, in the southern polar ocean. Here, the waters had lost even more of their coloring, and the water temperatures had dropped even lower. We're going the right way, we can tell. Before it was filthy, now it's hell, said Goopy and Baga, coughing and sputtering. Molly loped along over the water's surface without any sign of discomfort. If that water is so badly poisoned, doesn't it hurt your feet, Haroon asked him. Molly shook his head. Take more than that, a little poison, bah, a little acid, bah, a gardener's a tough old bird. It won't stop me. Then, to Haroon's surprise, he burst into a little rough, rough voice song, you can stop a check, you can stop a leak or three, you can stop traffic, but you can't stop me. What are we here to stop? Haroon reminded him, Adop adopting what he hoped was an authoritative, leader-like tone of voice, is the work of the cult master Khatum Shu. If it's true, there is a wellspring or source of stories near the South Pole, suggested If, then that's where Khatum Shu will be. You can... You can be sure of it. Very well, then, Haroon agreed, to the South Pole. The first disaster struck soon afterwards. Goopy and Baga, uttering piteous, whimpering noises, confessed they couldn't go any further. Never thought it'd be so bad. We have failed you. We feel sad. I feel terrible. She feels worse. We can hardly speak in verse. The waters of the ocean were growing thicker by the, by the mile, thicker and colder. Many of the streams of story were full of a dark, slow-moving substance that looked like molasses. Whatever is doing this can't be very far away, Haroon thought. To the plenty moth fishes, he said sadly, Stay here and keep watch. We'll go on without you. Of course, even if there is danger, they won't be able to warn us, Haroon realized. But the plenty moth fishes were already so miserable that he kept his thought to himself. The light was poor now. They were at the very edge of the twilight strip, very near the hemisphere of perpetual darkness. They traveled on towards the pole, and when Haroon saw a force standing up, from the ocean, its tall growths waving in, the, in a light breeze, the absence of light added to mystification. Land? Haroon asked. Surely there's not meant to be any land here. Neglected waters is what, what it is, said Molly in disgust. Overgrown, gone to weed, run down, nobody to keep the place in trim. It's a disgrace. Give me a year and the whole place looked like new. It was quite a speech for the floating gardener. 
He was plainly upset. We haven't got a year, Haroon said, and I don't want I don't want to fly over it. Too easy to spot, and we couldn't take you with us anyway. Don't you go worrying about me, said Molly, and don't be thinking about flying either. I'll clear away. And with that, he put on a great burst of speed and disappeared into the floating jungle. A few moments later, Haroon saw huge clumps of vegetation flying into the air as Molly got to work. The creatures who lived in this weed jungle rushed out in alarm. Giant albino moths, large gray birds that were all bone and no meat, long whitish worms with heads like shovel blades. Even the wildlife is old here, Haroon thought. Will there be dinosaurs further in? Well, not dinosaurs exactly, but the water-dwelling ones, that's right. Ichthyosaurs. The idea of seeing an ichthyosaur's head poking out of the water was both scary and exciting. Anyhow, they are vegetarians. Were vegetarians, he comforted himself. At least I think so. Molly strode back across the water to give a progress report. Bit of weeding, bit of pest control, have a channel ready in no time. And back in he went. When the channel was clear, Haroon directed but the hoopo to enter. Molly was nowhere to be seen. Where have you got to, Haroon called. This is no time for hide-and-seek, but there was no reply. It was a narrow channel with roots and weeds still floating on the surface, and they were deep inside the heart of the weed jungle when the second catastrophe occurred. Haroon heard a faint hissing sound, and an instant later saw something enormous being thrown in their direction, something that looked like a colossal net, a net that had been spun out of the darkness itself, it fell over them and held them tight. It is a web of night, said Butt the Hoopo usefully, the legendary Chupwalla weapon. Struggle is useless. The more you fight, the harder it grips. Our goose, I regret to inform, is cooked. Haroon heard noises outside the web of night, hisses, little satisfied chuckles. And there were eyes, too, eyes staring through the net, eyes like mudras with blacks instead of whites. But these eyes were not friendly in the least. And where was Molly? So were prisoners already, Haroon fumed. Some hero I turned out to be. Well, that chapter was better than the last one. But what is going to happen? What's going to happen to Batcheat? With her cherry lips. <laughs> She must be using some of that Carmex, Cherry Carmex lip balm. She must be. Bat cheap. Oh. Mr. Rushdie, you're something else. You are. You're something else, sir. Anyway.